looks like we're going to have to wind up. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Mr. Mike Hadlow, join Callan. I'm a 
use the lunch, the usual as such. Uh, what I got was my hearing horn. And this is the actual one that is in the film after the nasty goblin squashed it and I've attempted to prize it over. So I do take my career seriously. Mark has always been a little bit of a joke, really, haven't you? Well, no, not really. It's just that John is my mentor, and um, everything that I've learned has just been come from John Callan. So um, I guess if you look, think about that for nearly 25 years, then I've, well, we're both the new Abbott and Costello of The Hobbit. It was uh, extraordinary, it really was. The man really is a genius, and uh, his, uh, well, it sounds a little bit tossy, but his vision is absolutely incredible, and if you can hook into what he's thinking and the way he's working, you're gonna have a good time and get a good result. I think the amazing thing about Peter is that in his head, and you know it's in his head, he's got the beginning of the film, and he's got the end of the film, and he knows exactly where he wants the film to go in the middle. It's extraordinary. He knows exactly what he wants on set. He'll come in thinking about how, when we get there, where we put us, but he knows exactly what shot he wants. He knows exactly how his film is gonna go, and I think that is the success of Peter Jackson. He has this ability um, to visualize in his own head the entire project. I don't know how anyone does that. I haven't got, the f uh, it's impossible for me to even do a, like go from A to Z in one sentence. One of the things that he uh, did was allow every one of us to make contributions to the interpretation of the characters we were doing. And uh, then when he is directing us and we're actually shooting, he will have a look at what we, the actors are doing and will make adjustments depending on what's happening. Martin Freeman was absolutely wonderful to work with because not only was he totally dedicated to what he was doing, but he would also experiment with things as we were doing the recording, and Peter would hook on to an idea and he'd say, that one you did there in take three, let's have a bit more of that. So Peter didn't just have that vision in his mind, he was allowing us, the actors, to expand on that as we were working was uh, very rewarding. Two dwarves um, hardly had any prosthetic or anything on them, and they were Dino Gorman and Aidan Turner. We hate them. All the girls don't because they're beautiful and they're lovely and they're handsome and I love you Aidan, I love you Dean. Actually, um, they're horrible people. They're really, really nasty. They've um, got and, disgusting oh, yeah. personal and got habits. And their personal habits are appalling. Oh. But also, um, Aidan actually is an international dance champion as well. Just out of interest, if you're interested. A ballroom dance champion. We Two found this out. All island ballroom, ballroom dance, dance champion. Yes. I couldn't believe it. He was amazing. And he's just so. And he paints as well. Not only does he act. He paints and dances and probably does every other bloody thing in the world. I hate multi-talented people. And Dino Gorman is one of the most talented photographers oh. you'll come across. Oh, they love oh, I love I told him I needed some new headshots and would he mind doing them. How much was I went it? round to his place and he spent a couple of hours shooting things and then playing on the... Me, actually. And then playing on the computer, tweaking it and airbrushing various things as you do these days and uh, when I said okay send me a bill he said no no that's on me I hate him well um, there's one scene that every one job. of us has uh, got thoughts about and that is scene 88 <laughs> scene 88 is in the first film is it in any event, it uh, was set on the hills over Strathtyre in Otago there, and it went on not just for hours or days, but for weeks. And all we were doing was running, and 
Yeah, and Sir Ian, this great, great classical actor, was required to do nothing else than stand over there and yell at us, RUN, YOU FOOLS! <laughs> and we did, for weeks and weeks, which wasn't quite so bad, except with those costumes, I lost about 10 kilograms. I don't know how much you lost. Um, I was already felt and good looking by then. <laughs> And so terribly young. With yes, that's right. Yeah. Probably the most difficult scene, I think, from the perspective of comfort, was probably when we did the spiders. Um, even though 88 was long and we ran and we ran, and we also ran inside the studio as well from the perspective of 88, the spider scene was really, um, when we were actually wrapped in the cocoons, was quite, that was difficult because we were in the studio, we were dressed in our fat suits, we were dressed in all our gear, our makeup and uh, prosthetic uh, artists had already been instructed to do some extra cobwebs and put the synthetic cobwebs that had been made on us. We then went into wardrobe and put the wardrobe on that we were wearing for the day on top of our fat suit. Then they had already attached some of the synthetic cobwebs and to the costumes. We then went across to the, to the studio, into the wardrobe dressing area, where we were wrapped in synthetic cobwebs there. Um, we could still walk from there. We then went through the door into the actual studio on the set. We were put into some more synthetic cobwebs. Then we went into actually where we were filming the set, where we were to be laid down as a group, um, waiting uh, to be eaten by the spiders. When we were wrapped in another, which means another synthetic cobweb, we couldn't move. So basically we could, we could walk very carefully like this, would turn around and then two art department people would lay us down in the positions that Peter wanted us. And these were in positions where we were on people's feet or on people's arms or laying across someone. Then the art department would come in and put another about another three or four different layers of synthetic cobwebs over us. With all the lights, with all the smoke, with all the haze, with all the compost looking like um, Mirkwood, it was boiling. In fact, it was so hot that I know for a fact I fell asleep, even when the camera was rolling um, and was shaken by some someone, I can't remember who it was, but uh, that was probably, for me, the worst of it because I got an ear infection from the actual um, uh, the bacteria in the ground. It was terrible. Three months I had that. It was horrible. That was the worst for me. Hated it. Loathed it. Bring on 88. They made all the webbing out of uh, the same material our prosthetics were made out of and sprayed it across a bath of water and they had a frame about the size of a doorway and we actually had to walk through the frame so that this stuff would wrap right around us. Oh. Uh, we were in that same scene required to be hanging upside down and I was fascinated to know how we were going to do this especially when we were really well bound up in fact Mark did manage to walk onto the set I was put onto a little trolley that you see in the back of a truck a wheeled on um, but uh, when it came to shooting us hanging upside down, I went in and uh, the first AD said, OK, this is your mark, John, yes. So just keep your feet really still. And they turned the camera upside down and then they just shot us with a green background and we were just required to be there and just move our top part ever so slightly. And then they just turned it back up and stuck it in the film effectively upside down. Of course, before that, we had no idea, well, we did when you saw them, we had no idea what this was all going to look like. We had a sort of a rough idea from the sketches that we'd seen when we first were, were going to do the film way back at the beginning. But when we actually saw the result of the spiders, we could not believe how good the scene was. We actually saw Bilbo when he climbed up the tree through the canopy to have a look over the top of the trees. We all thought, bit of a naff shot, but when you saw it with the CGI and you saw um, Erebor in the distance and you saw Lake Town in the distance, unbelievable, wasn't it? We just yeah. couldn't believe it. And then he came back down and then we were all there and the spiders, I mean, the CGI on that, I thought, was out of this world. It was just amazing, wasn't yeah. it?
when I was cast as one of the dwarves, I reread the book and realized that Oin appears in the book in about three tiny sentences. So you can look at that from one of two ways. You can either go, oh, well, he's got bugger all to do, so I can put my feet up. Or you can do what we did, which was say, we effectively have carte blanche. How can you say that, John? Are you saying that Tolkien didn't do the job properly? And my answer is, of course he didn't, because he was writing a book. He wasn't making a film. And people get upset about the fact that we haven't been 100% with the film. I will question that, because what we've done is fill it out, and everything that we've done, I think you will find justification for in the appendices to the book, to a lot of uh, Tolkien's writing. For us as individuals, we had to do that for ourselves, so that as we were being filmed, doing whatever we were doing, we had the relationships with our brothers. There were three brothers, Nori Dori Ori, I had a brother, Gloin, and we worked out backstories, including, uh, I mentioned this yesterday, the fact that uh, Oin was an apothecary who, uh, in the olden days, was also something of a, uh, a birthing person and uh, was probably present at the birth of Gimli and dropped him on his head. <laughs> which would account for a lot about John Rhys Davis, wouldn't it? I think probably one of the, the most important things to work out that most of us who were sort of reasonably clever enough to work it out was that what we were doing was providing a, I guess what you could call a nucleus yeah. That, that anything could come out of, that we were in support of what was happening with the quest with regards to Richard's, Rich, Richard's quest and what Ken was doing as, um, as Barlam and also with what Bilbo was doing from the perspective of that. And what we did, and most of us adapted to that pretty quick, was realise that if we supported that, that was the way to get into the film. That not, I don't mean visually, but for us to be involved in it from, a, from, a, from an actor's perspective to support that. And I think that's what, what was one of the most yeah. important things to come out of it. If you were a team player, and that was the be beauty and the genius of Peter. He went around looking for people who could be team players. And most of the New Zealanders that uh, are in the film, from the perspective of the dwarves, I've worked with all, not just in theatre, or, or film, but in many other uh, genres as well. So uh, I've known John for nearly 25 years, 30 years nearly. I've known Jed Brophy, I've known Peter Hamilton, I've known William Kircher, I've known Dino Gorman. So we've all worked together in that environment and that really transferred itself. And the beautiful thing about that was the Angleterres, the, um, the Scots, the Irish uh, that came to join us as um, dwarves were in the same in the same vein, and they all and we just got on. There was no segregation of they're more important or more famous than we are. Um, we were just all on this same quest, and we went where Richard went, and it was beautiful. It worked really well. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Well, um, strangely enough, I was cast in a movie um, called Four Saints, which was actually due to be made last year, um, but. For the fourth time, their funding w was pulled. They lost their funding. So they had 26 million keyed up with half the funding ready to go. And I, I was cast as a, as a major in a First World War um, situation. Um, and that came directly from the film because the, one of the guys working on the film was the producer of it. And he liked what he saw in me. And so that was it. So that was a result from that. But to be honest, and we had this discussion, I went into the film with no expectations whatsoever. I mean, look at how we're dressed, for Christ's sake. Oh, oh, yes, that one there with the beard. Which one? Oh, no, that one, no, the wrong one. Yeah, I mean. The one with the big nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah the one with the big, yeah, the funny. Yeah, the short one. Yeah, oh, oh, no, yeah, no, no expectation whatsoever. The only thing you can do is, in that situation, is if you work well on it, you get on with people, you do what you're supposed to do. Actually, more work comes from people who uh, who are in that environment, who are working in the same environment, who can recommend you to someone else who's making the film. That was probably the most thing, uh, anything that we could expect from that, to be honest. The best fun ever. <laughs> this is something that tickled Peter's fancy a lot, didn't it? 
um, was the fact that I was playing Dory and Bert. And this, and he, I, I love him forever. But when we were doing the second unit stuff of the fight, and um, at that point I had my bolos, because I had a short sword, and I was a bit of an expert in using bolos, which is the, the balls on the chain. And um, so Pete came up with the idea that Dory should do the big swing and then <laughs> straight up into Bert's woodgies. Um, <laughs> And I sort of thought, hmm, self-abuse. Um, but Peter um, loved this idea of me being Bert and self-abusing myself with my character Dory. So when we came to the filming of it, it was a very strange feeling to be winging these bolos around then hitting myself in the balls as Bert, um, and Peter loved it, he, and I, God bless him, he kept it in the film, because Bert, ooh, so it was great, but that, that, was, um, that was one of my favourite bits in the film. It was very clear right from the very beginning that um, the very first meeting we all had, that we suddenly had become a whole bunch of giggling schoolboys. <laughs> And working up towards the food fight early on was one of the best things about the whole, the whole shoot, right early on. Tumbling in the doorway, we actually did shoot that, and as they were starting that, I thought, oh God, I'm 10 years older than the next person here. I'm gonna stand at the back and be the one who lands on top. And so they shot that, and then they took us out. And I actually think when the door opens and everybody falls down, that shot is actually our scale doubles. Um, people who were more diminutive, you could say, who were dressed up as us, yeah. But, um, yeah, it was very hot and heavy in there, but working up to that food fight was brilliant, and being given free reign, and we were, we were given free reign. It was like, okay, guys, go for it. But we were a whole bunch of school kids, and the biggest kid of all was Peter Jackson. Oh, he God. loved it. Yeah. The sillier it got, the more he loved it. Yeah. And he used to have this most, he has this most amazing giggly laugh when it's going well, isn't it? And he goes, <laughs> it's extraordinary. But um, I, I think also was that the fact that that was one of the things that we did pretty early on in the film. So we realized, and that's where the stick started, the shtick. Uh, Graham McTavish, who is really a lovely guy, but um, I, I would really get on his wick because I started to tease him terribly by not doing anything. But if John was, was McTavish, and he would be waiting to go on set. I'd just come up and stand by him like this, pushing everything into him. What are you doing? He wouldn't be, and in the, he would just say, You'll be doing that. If you go away, or I'll kill you. Um, I mean, it was just extraordinary. We used to have a lot of fun. But that's what was so important. And the other really neat moment from the food fight was when we learned the song. We went into the studio, um, uh, actually at Park Road Post. Um, it was so funny, we were learning a song in this edit suite with these big armchairs that the big um, executives from uh, New Line and, um, uh, and Warners. Warners would come and watch. And we were learning this song. And the schoolboys trying to learn, learn the school song. It was absolutely it was pathetic. Guys trying to sing who can't sing. Um, the most wonderful, worst singer of all is Dino Gorman, <laughs> who is the most beautiful young man but can't sing a note. Um, and um, a there, turn there, Yeah, there were a couple of people in there yeah. who, One they might be gorgeous, but they're useless. They've got no talent whatsoever. Shall we sing the first couple of lines? Sing it! Do it! Do it! Do it! You'll have to leave. Okay. okay. All right. Far over the misty mountains cold. Oh my god, oh this boy. 
Ambrose was great. Oh, God, yeah. We were actually tied. You were on it too, weren't you? No. No, no I was. That's right. Um, we were tied on the spit roast. We were at a huge spit roast. And we were turned round uh, and round. Um, and uh, Adam actually threw up when he got up. <laughs> And I actually had to do the Dr. Evil thing um, when he gets off. Or, or, gonna sick, gonna, gonna sick up, Ooh, gonna sick up. Because we were actually on there for nearly an hour and a half. And we were tied on Jimmy Nesbitt, myself going round and round. I mean, I mean, seriously, I, I don't like fun rides. I can't stand fun rides. And there we were. So all of those lines on the spit roast were actually invented lines by us to just try and get something done. Because Pete would say, hey, give us a couple of things. And Because Peter's laughing his head off, just absolutely loving it. While we're being turned, this big spit roast, how long, how huge would it have been? Uh, three, of, three of those stables? Yeah. It would have been would. three of those stables, and there were seven of us. Uh, eight of us tied on. There was five of you in the bag and eight of, uh, and eight of us on the spit. Holy crap. There they are, sweating like mad, being rotated over very hot lights, which represented the fire, throwing up on one another, yeah. and Peter Jackson's in the background going, oh! <laughs> Hilarious. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we both... Mm. I can't mention anybody's name. name, obviously, and Orlando Bloom is one name I won't mention. <laughs> Um, or William Kurt No, but um, actually, when we were doing the um, doing the scene with the cobwebs lying down, William, uh, at one point, we were told, OK, up you get. And we were given an order, and William stood up, and he was standing on what he thought was a rock. It was my head. <laughs> Ow. Yes. Um, oh. But... Uh, <laughs> Poor old Orlando did get the rough end of the stick one day when Peter Hamilton turned up and uh, he was in the trailer next to me and he knocked on the door and he said, oh, John, I'm, I'm feeling really, really odd. And I said, you look quite odd, actually, Peter, and you're not even made up yet. And um, he said, no, I feel really, really sick. I said, oh, do you think you're OK? He said, well, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. So he got dressed, went on set, and he was working with Orlando Bloom in the Mirkwood. And there's Orlando standing there, mouthing off, and Peter Hamilton comes up to him and he goes... <laughs> and chucks all the way down Orlando Bloom. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it's extraordinary. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really don't think um, most sane people change. I mean, we've been in the business too long. Um, both of us have been in the business for over 30 years. And, uh, and to be honest, this is what we do as our job. This is what our profession. And um, yeah, the fame is interesting, but you know, it's not glee. It's not 15 minutes of fame. This is what we do as our professional career. And um, some people, when they get cast it, first time ever, it's like, ah! And it's fantastic, and they go absolutely nuts on it. Um, unfortunately, it comes to an end rather abruptly. And um, if you're not ready for that, or you've got something else to go on to, it can be actually really a, a really downward spiral straight after it. So it's really important to have the right approach to it when you get cast and saying, wow, I'm lucky, I've done the audition well, I've got in, and I'm lucky, but I'm going to do a really good job on it. And whatever comes from that comes. It's like we were saying about expectation. No expectation, but anything from it will be good. One of the really good things is events like this, where we get to meet the people who I think we're really working for, who is yourselves, the people who go and see the film and buy the DVDs. You are the people who pay us, so it's a real treat for us to be here. Yeah. said about this being our profession, this is what we do, uh, in the last 20 years I've probably done more directing than acting, um, things you've probably seen, but um, Mark is currently, if you don't know, starring in a play at the Court Theatre here in Christchurch, obviously, uh, it's a play called When the Rain Stops Falling by an Australian writer, 
brilliantly written, and I went to see it last night, and I recommend it to each and every one of you. It's a fantastic piece of work, and Mark is brilliant in it. So do go along to the court theatre and see it. Take your friends. Thank you. Uh, sometimes there was nothing there. Certainly when we were fighting some of the spiders, there was nothing there. At other times, we had, there was one that we pulled apart, which was just an oval of green cardboard with legs stapled to it, and we had to pick it up and pretend we were pulling it really, really hard until it broke apart. Um, and what they did was combine the real action with the CG. Sometimes we were just talking to a green ball on the end of a stick, and sometimes, particularly with Ian McKellen, if he was in the room with us, which he frequently wasn't, um, we couldn't talk to him eye to eye. We would have to look at a point that was up there above his head. And uh, it was challenging, but it wasn't a challenge we couldn't meet. It was actually quite interesting. Quite the, interesting. The, um, the one that was uh, really interesting was when we fell through the, in the first film, when we th fell, th fell through the tunnel into the... Um, into the goblin into caves. Goblin caves. And we had a sequence, you know, when we were all escaping and fighting uh, goblins, where we had, and the set for that was absolutely phenomenal, but we had no concept of what the CG was going to do for that. I mean, when we saw it, I was absolutely blown away by what was there. I mean, it was incredible. But we had a whole um, uh, sequence of platforms and things that were put, walkways that we would run on as, as us fighting imaginary goblins. So we had these sequences, we'd come around the corner, cut the head off one goblin, uh, stab another goblin, defend yourself there from another goblin. And these were all imaginary apart from one or two stunt guys that were there to actually do a proper goblin. So that was, that was tough going, and we did that in, it was so hot, wasn't it? We could do five or six takes, and then, and this is, this is involving people like Jed Brophy, who is one of the fittest people, the most aesthetically, unbelievably fittest person I have ever, ever met in my life. He even had to, to, to almost lie down at the end of takes. He was so exhausted, wasn't he? Uh, My God. One, one of the actors, Stephen Hunter, who played Bomber, was carrying a bigger fat suit than anybody else. Is enormous. And he got so hot doing that, he became actually quite distressed and had to go off. We had a little tents built for us with air conditioning in them. And we would go there and we would stick the air conditioning down our, our costume, you know. In fact, some of the people playing goblins had uh, false heads and people were coming up to them. They were taking paper cups, cutting the bottom out of the paper cups, pushing them into the goblin's mouth and then they had cold electric fans that they were blowing into these people's faces. It really was extraordinary. The, the, and we had one scene where we had to fight with the goblins. Remember coming out when we first fell through? And they were like, oh, I don't know, maybe 60 or 70 goblins that were hanging around waiting in these full rubber sort of um, prosthetic suits. And I mean, it, the, I put my hand inside one of the guys. He said, put your hand inside here. So I put my hand in. The temperature in there must have been 40 degrees. Yeah. 40 degrees inside a suit. I couldn't believe it. In fact, um, but as things work out, when we did the scene and they had the, originally before we started, they had these head pieces that they had to put on and Peter came on set, saw one rehearsal of it and said, no, we're gonna CGI all the heads. Just like that, boom. He said, no, no, we're gonna CGI all the heads because they weren't good enough. Uh, and I mean, much to the delight of all the extras and all the stunt guys who were, who were playing the goblins. But uh, that was just extraordinary. We had, I had one extraordinary thing. What was the name? Ka Karen. Karen was, was this little, uh, little dwarf guy. He was actually original. Uh, um, he's actually the, he's the shortest stuntman in the world. He does his own stunts. He's an Indian guy, lives in um, London. And he's about this high. He is such a lovely man. He's got the most high-pitched, squeaky voice. And with an Indian accent. But um, anyway, we're shooting and he's playing one of these little small goblins. And Pete thought it would be a really good idea 
if he starts shagging my leg. So we've got him down here going like this to me when we're in that, uh, it wasn't in the film, I think, which is probably quite a good idea, but Pete, this is what I'm saying, Pete loves these sort of things. There is very little difference between Mark Hadlow and the character he plays, uh, except oh, Mark, oh, oh, oh. Mark is much less nasty and bitchy. Um, Mark is actually a very good friend to me throughout the whole thing because being considerably older than some of them, Mark was the one who would always come and make sure that I was all right. I think probably the most hilarious action reaction for me is Martin Freeman. <laughs> Martin Freeman's reaction to one of our one of our group doing something that he shouldn't have been doing in front of the camera and we're all behind and Martin Freeman's reaction by turning around and going <laughs> Remember that? Yes. I'll never forget that. Martin Freeman. The camera's here in front. He's around here looking like that and uh, the other person's here doing some which he shouldn't be doing and um, Martin Freeman with knowing we're behind And then back on Peter never saw it, of course. But um, that was probably the most funniest reaction. I, I mean, we all fell about. I mean, you can imagine it. The, the rest of us with head shaking, prosthetics going up and down, <laughs> ears wobbling, hair going wah, 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 wah. And Pete's obviously saying, what, what's going on? What's happening there? Is there something gone wrong? Oh yeah, no, 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 Pete. We just um, we thought something was quite hilarious, but I think we were all in the wrong scene. But it was hilarious. That was, that was my funniest moment. I'll never forget that. There were quite a few times where, uh, and it happened with Billy Connolly, where he first met me in costume with all the makeup and everything, and at the end of that day, as I was leaving, there was Billy, and I went over and I said, uh, see you tomorrow, Billy, uh, how was your day? And he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry, who the hell are you? <laughs> His, he, he had another wonderful reaction, because he did say this on a number of times, after he'd been in to do, we had what's called wardrobe trials, where what you do is your character, you go and put all of your costumes on, um, and you try them out, and then Peter, Fran, and Philippa will come in to see what they look like with the wardrobe department. And Billy had about six or seven of these different things to do every day. And uh, at one time, when we were at lunch, uh, I went up to him and said, how's your day going, Billy? Ah, oh, no, it's going all right, but... Uh, can you answer me one thing? I said, what's that? He said, how the f do you act in the sh they're putting on you? <laughs> and this was, and, and mind you, he wasn't the only one that said that. Oh, right. Everyone that came on set, um, because we'd, we'd been involved with it right through, but um, everyone that came on set just couldn't believe it, because honestly, seriously, the costumes were for real, they weren't fake, they were all made by Anne Mac... Mac and, and, oh, designed by, oh, what's her name, Anne? Anne Macro. And, yeah, that's it. And she did some fantastic designs, but they weighed a frickin' ton. They seriously did. We, what was it you got on the scales with all of your costume, your yeah. fat suit and everything on? You weighed yourself. How much extra was it? Uh, yes, there was one day, it was when we were shooting on the cliff edge with the giant rock uh, creatures bashing each other up. They had pouring rain, full costume, with additional uh, bags and blankets we were carrying, and a huge cape, and I had a hoodie underneath made of wool, so everything we're wearing is wool and leather. Then they put the rain on, and so all this stuff just soaked up all this rain, and we weighed ourselves at the end of the day. I was carrying 53 kilograms. Yeah. Quite extraordinary. That was on average. The barrels sequence. The barrel sequence has to be, in my book, probably the best fun I've ever had in my life. I'll tell a little bit of it and then John can take over from his perspective. Not only did we film this in Polaris, underneath the Polaris Bridge, um, going down the river in the wild, and, and, and that was very much fun. It was a fat suit and we all got waterlogged and etc. etc. And that was the outside shots part of it. And that was fantastic. Then we went back to Wellington to do the studio version of it. We had built for us a water causeway that was like 
I don't know, probably twice, twice as wide as this, um, well, from the perspective of what it was in, and about two and a half to three metres wide that went round on a big rectangular, uh, rectangular type circle that had two V8 engines, rocket engines, that propelled the water around this causeway. And we put the barrels in there, and we went for a trial on the first day. When I saw it, I couldn't believe it. We got in the barrels to try them, and Pete said, well, we'll only put the jet engines up to about four, uh, four notches up of the 10. We put them in, we got in, they were up to eight, I think, by the time we, it was the best fun I've ever had in my life. Johnny, you can tell Yeah, we all agree, when they make Hobbit World at Disneyland, the barrel ride will be the number one ride. It was outstanding. The uh, water was projected through uh, big tubes which could be lifted. And as you lifted them, uh, the water became more turbulent. And just at one of the corners of the round rectangle, there was uh, a thing that looked like a tip truck up high on some scaffolding. And that held two tons of water. And at a given point, and we learned afterwards that Peter Jackson was timing things so that it would specifically land on specific actors as they came around, this thing would tip up, the water would come down, hit a kind of half barrel, shoot up, and we would get two tonnes of water on our heads. And we loved it. It was the it was only brilliant. time, it was the only time where 13 Stunt performers never got a look in. It was the best Disney ride I've ever been on in my life, wasn't it? Yeah, and being in The Hobbit was probably one of the, if not the, most extraordinary rides of my career. Yeah. It was absolutely wonderful.